All right, good evening. I'm doing this lecture. This is chapter 10. It's going to be on April 22nd, 2020. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> at night. So I'm, I'm tired. But I have no other time to do it. So anyway, um, today we're going to be doing chapter 10. Uh, it's not going to be that long. Uh, it's going to be on reaction rates and chemical equilibrium. So it'll be pretty interesting. Okay, but big elephant in the room. What the hell is going on with this class? It's my fault because I have misled you with announcements and then taking away announcements and then and then I, I, I didn't know what was going on. So basically, I'm going to tell you this slide right here, take a picture of it. This is what's going on for the next couple of weeks. I'm an idiot. So what that means is when I taught this class last year, chapter 10 wasn't in the curriculum. Then they put it back. Then I had to change my tests. So I forgot I haven't taught this class in a long time. Whatever. So exam three, we'll cover eight, nine, and chapter 10. Definite, 100%. Chapter 10 will be covered covered in the lab also. I think it was already. Um, I'm not sure if they're on the same week schedule, but it, it's there too. Chapter 11 will be covered after exam three, and it'll be covered in the uh, final. So chapter 11 is important for final and for uh, 122. Chapter 11, we're learning about acids and bases, and... Um, in 122, you're going to put the concepts that we learned today together with acids and bases, and you're going to learn chemical equilibrium with weak acids and strong uh, weak acids and weak bases to figure out the pH, etc. So um, this week, I'm going to post chapter 10 and maybe 11 if I get to it, probably by the weekend. Exam three is going to be on the week of May 4th through May through so Monday, May 4th. I'll release it, and you'll have until. Uh, uh, Sunday, May 10th. So you'll have six days complete or seven days to finish it. And it'll be just like exam two, exactly the same format. I'll do a review, little 10 minute thing for that as well. Um, so again, chapters eight, nine, and 10 will be on exam three. The practice exam three will be due on the 10th as well, which is when the regular exam is due. And it'll be due at midnight, as same as the regular exam. The review for the final exam, which will cover chapters two, through, let me see if I can write it with a pen. There we go. So it will cover chapters 2 through 11. Oh no, am I going to have this problem again? I hope not. Okay. So it will cover chapters 2 through 11 on the final. And we're going to cover some things after chapter 11, but that will not be on the final. So don't worry about that. But it's important for next year. Okay. So I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, email me. Fly on the screen. All right. So email me and let's let's go. All right. So chapter why does it say chapter four? I don't know. Whatever. Chapter ten. Okay. So we're gonna learn about reaction rates or rates of reaction. Everything takes time. Right? So if you put every type of react if you put NACL in water, you have to mix it and it does take a physical amount of time for it to dissolve, even if it happens to our eyes instantaneously. But reactions that we can observe every day, and we can see the process of them, are things like oxidation or rust, right? Rusting, you get a new bike, <clears throat> it's great. It's no, no, or anything metal, really, anything iron. <clears throat> it's, um, it's not rusted, it's all shiny. Then you leave it out in the elements for a year, two years, you start to see rust on it. That is, the, that is a very long chemical reaction due to exposure to oxygen radicals. And then the oxygen radicals create oxidation and react with the iron to make iron oxide. Um, tarnishing is another example. Even banana, you see there five days, banana ripening. Um, these reactions, they, they, they take time. So what we're going to do <coughs> in this chapter is the fig there's a way to measure the rate that the reaction occurs, meaning the rate that the reactants make the products. So there's a rate for that. And that's exactly what this is showing. Even aging is... I don't like this picture because it's like it, the baby's cute though. But still, it's <clears throat> there's a lot there's a lot more going on there than just aging is not a chemical reaction. It is thousands and millions and millions of chemical reactions that create an older person over time. But the idea is that it takes time, <clears throat> and the rate of chemical reactions can be influenced by temperature, pressure, a catalyst, things like that. And we'll go over what those mean. <clears throat> All right, so. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we need to establish a concept. And I, I kind of talk about this concept often that on a molecular level, reactions occur 
by collisions. So for a reaction to occur, not only does a molecular collision need to happen, but it needs to happen at the right energy and the right molecule orientation. But if you put a beaker of, in this case, N2 and O2, you have an entire room of it, where there's billions and billions of particles. This is just one-to-one. -one. So this reaction that I'm, we're looking at right now is just N2 to O2. Only one and one. Looking at it, this is on the simplest level, but in reality, billions of these are going on in the space of a cubic centimeter. So <clears throat> the average collisions that they'll go through will, if they're, gonna, if they're meant to react, will, will, uh, will react. But the idea is the rate that this happens over a large sample can be measured. That's what we're measuring. Not the rate of reaction of one particle because this particle reacts with this particle. It happens instantaneously and then it's a product. We need, or here, and then it's a product. We're talking about thousands and billions of molecules, the rate that the concentration of these uh, reactants make these products. And that's a rate, usually it's um, described in the unit, it's literally called one over S, or per second. And what that means is how many products were formed per second. So if you have a thousand per second, that means the reaction is pretty fast. Well, depending which reaction you're talking about, but that could be pretty slow for some reactions. But um, that's the, the unit we use per second. So the idea is that these molecular collisions are happening and they dictate whether the reaction occurs. And there needs to be certain criteria for that to happen, whether that be energy, meaning so insufficient energy. All that means insufficient speed. They don't have the correct speed. Because if whoever out there is taking physics, energy, kinetic energy, is one half mv squared, right? So let's say the mass doesn't really the mass doesn't really matter. They're so small that the mass doesn't matter. So it's all dependent on velocity. So and that's the speed of the particles. They need to have a sufficient speed in order to make a reaction, and the correct orientation. For example, we I talked last week I think about hydrogen bonds. If you have a high oh that's not water. So if you have a hydrogen bond between the oxygen of one molecule, one water molecule, and the hydrogen of another, this happens because they're in proximity to each other, right? If the hydrogen was over here, this hydrogen, there's a reason why this hydrogen doesn't react with this oxygen. And the simple reason is they're just not close enough. Proximity matters in chemical reactions and bonds. Sometime, and we measure this in angstrom. So the uh, chemical length for the average hydrogen bond is around three angstroms. Anything less than that, that's a very, very small distance. It's, lo it's smaller than nanometers. So anything less than this is probably going to make a hydrogen bond. Anything more, probably not. So the idea is that orientation matters in chemical reactions and, and making new chemical bonds. So that's important. So right now we have speed and orientation. That's what you need. Okay. So activation energy. <clears throat> so um, an activation energy is literally the amount of energy needed for the reaction to occur. And for every single reaction has a specific activation energy. That activation energy can change based on different conditions. And these conditions are, are um, these conditions affect these one through three. So basically these conditions are required for any reaction. So I kind of went over these already. You need a collision. You need, a, a, duh, obviously you need a collision. You need the correct speed and the correct orientation. So here we need collision, orientation, and energy, right? Energy basically means speed. So we have those three. Now, there are factors that dictate these three. So they can change this, these three. They can make collisions happen faster, slower, and one of those is, there's a bunch of them. There's temperature temperature, there's pressure, there's concentration, right? If you have more particle, more of, um, let's say you increase the concentration, you have a reaction going on like this, like this one, and you increase the nitrogen particles and the oxygen particles, what's going to happen? More reactions per second, right? So that increases the rate. That's exactly what happens. So, um, yeah. 
Um, those are those are the three main ones. Uh, orientation. So you need we know that, and there's different things that nothing really dictates orientation. There there's so many particles that the correct orientation will be that will will occur because all these molecules are spinning and colliding billions of times per second. So don't really that worry. Orientation is important, but eventually they'll reach the correct orientation given enough speed and given um, enough energy to collide, and enough speed to collide, and then energy we just talked about. Okay, so here's what an activation energy curve looks like, or and every reaction has one of these. So I'm going to go over this. You need so first you have products, or sorry, no, that's not true. First you have reactants. That's the initial state. You put both of the things in the beaker and nothing happens. So they have a specific energy. It may not be zero. Sometimes if there's a large repulsive force between these or a large attractive force, that contributes to some energy level. So this is energy level, I'll call it I, right? That's initial. Then the reaction occurs. There's gonna be a lot of collisions, a lot of movement, a lot of attraction, a lot of things going on in the process of a chemical reaction. That is what's responsible for the increase in energy to this point of the activation energy, the energy required to actually react. They're going to gain enough speed and they're going to react. Then they come back down to a lower energy state when they're done reacting, right? Because there's no need for an excess movement. There's nothing, there's no chemical, there's no chemical force driving any interactions anymore. So that's why reactions happen. When you have two reactants that are readily react with each other, there is a chemical force that is driving them to react. Whether that be weak or strong, it's there. Once they are already done reacting, that chemical force is no longer. Therefore, they're at a lower energy state. So, um, well, I mean, in this, in this point is where the, all the energy is, at the activation energy. But sometimes... You could even have reactants that start off at a high energy. Let's say they're really volatile. Then a reaction happens where they reach their max energy. And then their final state is over here. That's totally possible. So these are two different types of reactions. This one is called an endothermic. I'll put endothermic. That means it takes in heat, right? You sort of, um, basically nothing, energy equals heat. They're, uh, very similar. For our cases, it does. So reactants equals pro reactants energy is lower than the products endothermic, right? And that difference is the amount of energy, not from curve to curve, from here to the baseline, is the amount of energy that is uh, gained. Then you have this type of reaction, which is called exothermic. Exothermic. This means it loses energy. The initial energy state of the product of the reactants is very high. The reaction occurs, then the products are extremely stable. Therefore, they don't really have that much energy in between them. And it's a lower energy than it starts out with. And here's the progress of the reaction. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. And you can always rewind anything I say. Okay, so if this is the true... Where's my pen? She's playing with stuff. Anyway, so the reaction rate can be expressed as a equation. So, and this makes sense. Now, if you have reactant, if we have reactant A, I don't know where I'm going with this. We'll see what happens. Reactant A going reactant B, the amount of concentration change, let's say this is one molar, right? And this is one molar. The amount of concentration change to create a product, and this is zero molar at first, correct? Let's say it is. Then, so we'll put initial then final you have after the reaction occurs you have oh no you have zero b if this reaction goes to completion you have zero and c you have one molar nope put that there you have one molar this means that both of these reactants their concentration was changed they went from completely being there at one molar to nothing because all every single particle was turned into a product here. And that product was A plus B makes AB, and that product, or AB, whatever, C. And 
that concentration of the product is one molar. So a way we can represent this is the change in concentration of one of the reactants to a product in an amount of time. So if this reaction took one hour, that means the reactants changed one molar per hour. They went from one to zero in one hour. So change in concentration of a reactant or product divided by the change in time. That's how you determine a rate. It's a change divided by a change. Or it's something divided by a change. In this case, it's a change. All right. So uh, we went over this. The factors that change the rate of reaction. We have temperature is one of them. And we'll talk about them in, in detail. You have the reaction concentration. Also pressure. But I don't think we go over that one here. And then you have adding a catalyst. So we'll go over what a catalyst is. Um, if those of you who take biology or have taken biology, you know that an enzyme is a catalyst. That's a biological catalyst. And what that does is it... Um, speeds up the rate of reaction by lowering the energy required to react. And I'll go over what that means. But first, temperature. So at a, basically, we'll go over them very quickly. At a higher temperature, the increase in kinetic energy, meaning the speed, is increased. Think about this logically. We talked about gases a whole ton. I went on a rant about molecule. I go on all these molecular rants. But temperature, if, it, if temperature increases, it makes the molecules move faster. They move faster, they collide more. And also they're faster, they collide with more energy. Therefore, the reaction rate is increased. And it's a good rule of thumb, which I don't really, I've never used this rule of thumb before. I actually figured this, I actually found this out when going over these slides in the first place. Uh, so chemists really never use this. Um, for every 10 degrees Celsius increase in temperature, most of the reaction rates are approximately doubled. So that's pretty cool. But yeah, so that's how temperature affects. Okay. Then concentration. So I already talked about this one already, but we'll cover it right now again. So in a reaction, you have, let's say we have one and one. It's in a, let's say it takes an hour. Let's say it's like a, a minute, right? Pretty quick. Or it's actually pretty slow. So one minute. A one to one, this one meets this one, takes a minute. You have two of them. You increase the concentration of them. The chances of them collide, think of them all as like little pinballs. The chances of them colliding with each other are a lot greater. The chances of the blue ones colliding with the red one is a lot greater because there are two of the blue ones. So there's two possible collisions. One, two, and, or sorry, one right here, this arrow, and two is this arrow. So the more possible collisions, the increased rate of collisions. And what that means is the increased reaction rate. So basically, what we learned so far, if you increase temperature, increased rate. If you increase concentration, increase rate. And keep in mind, this is concentration of the reactants. Sometimes you increase the rate of the increase the concentration of the products, it slows down the reaction until it reaches an equilibrium. And then you can see here in this third example, if you have two of these red ones and two of the blue ones, it just makes more possible collisions. Okay, next a catalyst. So a catalyst, it speeds up the rate of reaction by their def I don't like the definition by providing an alternate pathway that lowers activation energy. Okay, basically. So let's talk about biological catalysts, an enzyme, because this is enzymology is like my field. All right, this is an enzyme, right? That's enzyme. Then what the enzyme does is let's say it takes. For our intensive purposes, it takes two things, right? We'll call it S1. And enzymes can do a lot of things, right? Let's just say this enzyme. It's designed to take S1 plus S2 and make S12. That's what it's designed to do. So that's our reaction right now. No big deal. Okay. So if you put S1 and S2 in a beaker together, right? They will react, but it will take some time because they will have to find each other. And then obviously, if you increase the temperature, if you increase the concentration, yeah, they will increase the rate of reaction. But let's just say those are held constant. You have one molecule and one molecule. It will take a certain amount of time for those molecules to meet each other with the right energy and the right orientation and to make a collision. 
The enzyme's job is to interact with both of them. So let's say this enzyme has two, a binding site right here. It loves, is a high affinity to S1. So that means if enzyme is anywhere nearby S1, S1 sticks directly to here. And it also has a binding site for S2. If, if enzyme is anywhere near S2, S2 binds right there. So this enzyme is kind of like, is acting like, um, I don't know, like if you were to set your friend up with somebody you know, that's what the enzyme is doing. It has a connection to each one of the parties that are going to react together. Kind of like a, yeah, that's a good example. Um, okay, so what happens is the enzyme will then have S1 and S2 in its, act, in its binding sites where they're supposed to go. They have a really high um, attraction to these specific sites and for a lot of biological reasons. But so yeah, that wasn't a joke. That was actually biological, like, like and like amino acid residues and stuff. But that's biology. Um, okay. So then it creates this complex. This is enzyme. Then this complex, um, the enzyme brings them closer together in order for them to react. And then you get S12 as our product. And then the enzyme goes away. And the enzyme is right there. Okay, so basically you can rewind that and hear what I said again. I'll just keep going. The, cat, the enzyme is a biological catalyst and a non-biological catalyst works exactly the same way. There are chemicals out there that when you put them in a reaction, they kind of guide other chemicals from, to react with one another. And a lot of, one example is um, hydrogen, gas, and palladium. That's a, that's a common organic catalyst that actually brings organic molecules together more frequently. And it'll kind of guide them to each other. So an enzyme does that on a biological level. And it guides multiple, uh, one substrate or multiple substrates to make a product. So another key thing about an enzyme, and in, in essence, what this does is it decreases the energy of the entire container when the reaction occurs. What do we call that? The activation energy. So here's the activation energy before a catalyst in the green. After a catalyst, it's purple. What happens is the energy level decreases when the reaction is occurring. Why? Because the, uh, the enzyme or the catalyst is helping the molecules reach each other rather than having them waste kinetic energy by, by bouncing all around the container and eventually finding a, uh, a way to, a way to um, collide. That will take longer and that will take more energy. So it lowers the activation energy and at the same time, that happens to decrease the reaction, sorry, that happens to increase the reaction rate. So good association is a lower activation energy, the higher reaction rate. So that's a good rule of thumb. Okay. Another thing is during a reaction, the catalyst is not changed or consumed. You notice in this reaction, the only thing that changes is S1 and S2 becomes S12. Enzyme is still enzyme. Enzyme could do it again and again and again and again. The catalyst can keep working. Even if there's one catalyst molecule in there and there's, let's say 50 reactions to occur, it can do each one, one at a time. And then that will increase the rate of the reaction of the entire beaker. But if you add more enzyme, if you add more catalysts, it will obviously do it faster. And that's when you get into a lot of bio biological biochemistry stuff. Okay. So anyway, here's our, or what we got. Increased temperature, more collisions, higher, re higher um, re increased reaction rate. Increased reaction concentration, more collisions. Add a catalyst, lowers the activation energy. Increases the chance of collisions. Okay. So let's do a uh, quiz. You can pause it here, but indicate the f effect of each of the fa factors, blah, 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 on the reaction rate. Okay, raising the temperature, it'll go faster. Removing O2. So if you remove O2 completely, that would make it go a lot slower, right? Because CO 
would have nothing to react with if you remove it completely. Even if you remove some of it, it will still decrease the reaction rate. Adding a catalyst, increase. Lowering the temperature, decrease. Good. Yay, good job. All right, next. State the effect of each of the following on the rate of reaction again. Um, so decreasing temperature decreases rate of reaction. Removing one of the reactants decreases. Adding a catalyst increases. Placing the reaction flask on ice. In essence, decreasing temperature. So it decreases the rate. Increasing the concentration of a reactant increases the rate because it increases the chance of collision. All right, good. Chemical equilibrium. All right, so we're going to learn more about this in Chapter 11 when we deal with acids and bases. But what we need to know is that reactions can happen both ways, forward and backwards. These are, we, these are what we call equilibrium reactions. Because sometimes the, the products don't, or the, uh, the reactants don't like to react that well. They react a little bit, but then they actually stop. And there's many reasons why this occurs. It really depends on the reaction, but some of it's like pH and stuff like that. But let's just say, for our intents and purposes, the reaction goes to its, its own completion. Every reaction is characteristic. It's its own system. And some systems like to go more towards the products, and, some, and, and the reactants are completely used. Some systems are kind of 50-50, and some systems have most of the reactants unreacted. That's actually a thing. So you could say, oh, why is that even a reaction then if it's un unreacted? Um, because it's a weak reaction, but the products may be used for something. So let's say the dissociation of um, hydrofluoric acid. So hydrofluoric acid is a weak acid. And it dissociates into H plus plus F minus. This reaction only goes, in, well, it's actually two lines like that. This reaction only goes 5%. So what that means... Hold on. Um, so this means that out of, let's say we have 100 molecules. This means that five of them are HF, or sorry, five of them are product. Five of these HFs broke apart into H plus F. The other 95 are still HF. And the answer to why that is, that's just the equilibrium of that reaction. Every reaction has its own equilibrium. And it has a certain forward rate and a backward rate. When those rates equal, you're in equilibrium. Okay, so we went over that. It's a reversible reaction. We see that, good. All right, so basically, I would never ask you to do this because it's just stupid easy. Um, or it's not really a smart question. Uh, write the forward and reverse reactions for the following. CH4 plus that and that. So this is the forward reaction. Basically, you're just writing it one way, and then the reverse, you're flipping it. You see the products are now here. The rea the rea but you, you don't need to do that. The double lines tells you that, that it goes both ways. So I'm not worried about that. Okay, so let's talk about the reaction progression. And then I might split this into two videos and take a break. Yeah. All right. So the reaction progression. Basically, when you start a reaction, you are going to be over here where you're going to have all reactants and no products, right? So you're going to have um, all, I'll put R, X, N, T. That means reactants. And then... Okay, so let's see. Initially, you put all the reactants in a beaker. The rate of the forward reaction, right? You have the forward reaction, the backward reaction, F, and it reverses R. The forward reaction will happen at a really fast rate because all you have is reactants and you have no products. So we're like, quick, even if the reaction doesn't go through all the way, quick, we need to make some products to balance ourselves out. And they'll have all the, also no choice because they're just in the beaker. So they have to react. That means the rate of the forward reaction will be high. The rate of the reverse reaction will be zero. Over time, the rate of the forward reaction will start to decrease because there are less and less reactants left over. 
then at the same exact time, the rate of the reverse reaction will increase because there are more products now that some of those products want to go back to reactants. Why? Because they have the double arrow and then maybe some of them aren't happy as products. Eventually there will be a point where the reaction rates of the forward and the reverse reaction equilibrate at the same point. That is called equilibrium. Or it doesn't have to be at the same point. They equilibrate at a certain level. That's equilibrium. When they stop changing. The, rea the rates, the reaction rates stop, cre stop. Not the concentration. So a common misconception that the concentration or the amount of molecules on the left side and the right side has to be 50-50. No. The reaction we just went over before, one of them, the, product, the products could be 5%, the reactants could be 95%. But the idea is that the rates at which one of the products go to reactants and the reactants go to products is the same at a certain time or after a certain time. That's when equilibrium is reached. Okay, moving on. So then you can do the reverse reaction and you can write the same equilibrium equa equation in terms of concentration. Or no, you could do the forward. Is, what is this? Is it forward? Okay, same thing. But you can write it in terms of concentration. Notice how the y axis is concentration. Here it's reaction rate. So if we have concentration, this makes a little bit more sense. If you're if you're not good at thinking about, all oh right, the rate is the time, but whatever. So or things per time. They're just amount. A concentration, pure amount. Initially, a lot of reactants, right? You just put everything in the beaker. Then they're going to dissipate. They're going to go away because they're reacting, reacting, reacting. At the same exact time, the amount of products is increasing because the reactants are directly being turned into products. And then eventually an equilibrium point will reach where the concentration of the reactants and the concentration of the products are, are, are straight. They're not going to change at all. Th they don't have to be equal, right? In this case, they're not equal. One is all the way down here. The products are all the way up here. They're not equal concentrations, but they stop changing. Change in concentration equals rate. The rate has stopped changing. So that's that. Okay. Here's just a... Here's, yeah, this is a good pictorial representation of that. Okay. So... At the time zero, these, let's, let's say, okay, the purple and the white are reacting to create purple-white, like this. Time zero, throw them all in a beaker. Purples and whites, nothing reacted. Concentration of reactants, there's eight. Concentration of product, there's none. What's going to happen? The forward reaction has to be full throttle because there's no other choice. After a minute, one, two, two purple-whites, two products, six reactants. Six reactants, two products. The reverse rate, because products are around, but there's not many of them. The concentration of them is not high. Therefore, they're not going to find that many collisions together to really react and to really go backwards. So it's going to be a very slow reaction. The forward reaction will still be fast because the higher concentration is the reactants. Then over time, even when they're equal, the re the let's say they reach an equilibrium. Here is the equilibrium for this specific reaction. So equilibrium, equilibrium, concentration is reaction. Rxn means reaction specific. That means it really depends on what reaction you're talking about to know the equilibrium um, the equilibrium concentrations. So in this one, for an example, the re concentration of the reactants is 2. The concentration of the products is 6. So it's more favored towards the products, but most importantly, the rates at which one goes backwards and one goes forwards are equal. Therefore, the concentration will not change. Okay, so here's an example. You can take a look at that. It's really the same thing we talked about. Um, then... We talked about this already, but you can take you can take notes on it. Okay, so let's do this. So complete answer following with is R not equal changes does do uh, whatever that means. All right. So before equilibrium is reached, the concentrations of the reactants and products blank. 
before it's reached, they're changing, right? So, I mean, they're, they react, their reaction, the reactants are becoming products, but that rate or that concentration is constantly changing. So it changes at equilibrium. The rates of the forward to the rate, wait, the rate of the forward reaction blank to the rate of the reverse reaction. Oh, it's equal, right? Because that's what we're making equal. It's the rates, not the concentrations. I don't have the answers there, but those, those were the answers. Okay, so here's an example of a forward and reverse reaction. Again, right? In this case, you're reacting SO2 with O2. And when they react together, they get SO3. Initially, you don't have any product. The reaction occurs. Then you have all product. And then eventually these rates are, then the SO3 is going backwards because it doesn't want to be all products. It wants to be a balance of reactants and products. That balance is the equilibrium point. So it's kind of like, um, if you ever play those games where you need a tap to keep, like Flappy Bird, Flappy Bird, right? You need a tap to keep the bird like in the middle. That's exactly what this is. The middle is like an equilibrium. There's a perfect happy, happy bird, happy amount of product and reactant. And that's exactly what this is. So, yeah, think of it as like Flappy Bird. Is like initially you have to press, press, press to keep it going up, but eventually you need to hold off of it to let the bird come down to go in between the little blocks or whatever, or whatever game to keep it kind of in the middle. It's really balancing. You're balancing it. You're compensating one way or the other until it's completely balanced and equal, but with two reactions. Okay. Reactants form products in the blank reaction. So that would be the forward reaction. At equilibrium, the reaction concentration, reacting concentration, what are they looking for here? So at equilibrium, oh, it doesn't change. Right, the concentration doesn't change and the rate doesn't change. Products form reactants in the blank reaction, the backward reaction, the reverse. All right, good. All right, another thing about... Uh, equilibrium constant. So I might I might give you a, a test question on this. Basically, there's this thing called an equilibrium constant, and it's used in reactions all the time. And what it measures is at equilibrium, what is the ratio of products to reactants? So A plus B, AB. That's a reaction. At equilibrium. So when these reaction rates are equal, what is the concentration of the reactants and what's the concentration of the products? Let's say for this reaction, four, one, and one. It likes to be favored more towards the products, and there, but there's still some reactants left in equilibrium. What you do is you take the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So it would be four over one times one equals four over one. Then, if K is greater than 1, high amount of products are favored at equilibrium. Hey, look, we have a reaction concentration, or reaction constant of 4. That means that there are 4 times as many products. Uh, not necessarily. It can get complicated. But that means there is more products concentration than there is reactant. And that means the, it, that means the reaction is heavily favored towards the products. But if it was less than 1, that means a high amount of reactants are favored, meaning the reaction does not go to completion too well. So let's say HF is going to go both ways, H plus plus F minus. This one would be 1. This one would be 99. That's the actual ratio that they occur in. So our constant would be 1 over 99. or one, Yeah, 1 over 99. So that's very small, less, much less than 1. So this would be more favorably towards favorably favored towards the reactants. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I'm going to take a break here and then I'll start another video in like a second. I'll splice them both together. All right, moving on. So uh, 10.4 using the equilibrium constant. So we just went over the equilibrium constant. If it's greater than one, it's highly towards the products. If it's less than one, it's highly towards the reactants. So the next couple of slides you can pause here. It's just going over that. Um, the kind of constants you would see, they are mostly scientific notations. So in this one, you have, because usually they're really large or really small numbers. Because remember, the reaction 
constant is a ratio between the products and the reactants. So um, sometimes you might have one reactant in the micromolar range and then some in the, in the molar range. So you might have a, a big, big difference there. Um, so we're not going to go over exactly how to create the reaction constant because you see this squared here. Why is this squared? That's literally because of the coefficients. But we're not going to go over the math for that. That's more of in Chem 2. But what we're going to focus on is the actual number. So this is greater than 1. It's going to be mostly products, very few reactants when it reaches equilibrium. And then here's the opposite. 2 times 10 to the negative 9. Very, very small. Much less than 1. You have mostly reactants and very little products in the equilibrium. So here's just an example of, of that graphically. Here's a good summary slide of that. Um, here's some common uh, equations, common reactions, and here's their equilibrium constant. So yeah, just pretty good. Um, all right, so for each case, and sometimes it's Kc, uh, meaning constant of, or equilibrium constant for concentration, um, indicate whether the reaction mixture at equilibrium contains most of the reactants products. 10 to the 95. That's incredible. That's that's crazy high. So it's a lot, a lot greater than one. Mostly react. Mo yeah, mostly products. A lot less than one. Tens to negative seven. Mostly reactants. So good. All right. The last thing we're gonna do is La Chatelier's principle. All right. So basically, what this means is the equilibrium will shift. So you have a set equilibrium point, meaning. Uh, one percentage of the concentration is in the reactants and one is in the products. But the equilibrium does shift when you remove products or reactants in order to balance out the equilibrium and rebalance it. So basically, this is, so here's the uh, definition. states, when that the stress is placed on a reaction at equilibrium, the system responds by changing the rate of the forward or reverse reaction in the direction that relieves the stress. Literally a balance, like you're balancing on a balance beam, right? You're going to fall off in the, right in, the, in the right direction. You're going to put your left arm out in order to balance your body, or you're going to move your hips or something towards the opposite direction in order to relieve that stress. When you bend over, your butt goes backwards because if you just bent over, it's completely straight, you'd fall over. And the reason why is because we want to center our, our weight. So that La Chatelier's principle is the same exact thing, but for a chemical reaction. So let's take a look. You have tank A and tank B. Let's say tank A is, represents reactants. Tank B represents products. If you were to add more water to tank A, a reaction flows just like water, right? Because they're in very, it's billions of molecules. They're all close together. They're all moving around like a liquid. Even if they're in gas state, they're moving around. If you put more of tank A, what's going to happen? They are, tank A water is going to move to tank B. This will happen instantaneously. As soon as you put more water in tank A, it will move to tank B in order to create a new equilibrium. And the new equilibrium will have a higher concentration of each one just to balance them out because you added more to the system. So it's pretty straightforward from there. Now, let's say we have this forward reverse reaction, this reversible reaction, and you add hydrogen, H2. If you add H2 to this reaction, the equilibrium will shift towards the right, towards the product, because you have, very similarly to here, tank A, the reactant tank, is now overfilled. In order to relieve that, that inequilibrium step, what you're going to do is, or what's going to happen is, Everything will relieve towards the product of the least stress. This goes into what I always say about everything in chemistry and in, 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 in physics and in the world. Everything behaves in a gradient. It goes from high to low. It happens with gases. It happens with pressure. It happens with um, uh, potential energy. It happens with uh, movement, with everything. Everything goes from high to low. And that is true for reactions too. They go from a high energy state or a, a pressured state to a not pressured state. That's what happens here. So you can see that literally from high to low. Okay, so that's just showing it graphically. Let's see if we do the opposite. If you remove hydrogen, the reaction is going to be like, oh crap, we're have, we have an unbalanced, we're imbalanced hydrogens. Oh no, we need to replenish that lost hydrogen. So the rate of the reverse reaction will increase. 
So this, ba- this teeter totter balance should be a really Im- is a really important concept for the exam. So I can give you a reaction. I give you A, B, and C. Part A. What happens if you add more hydrogen? Is it going to go to the left, to the right, or not change? Oh, it goes to the right, or meaning the equilibrium constant. Well, will it get higher or lower or, or what? If you remove more, if you add um, HI, what's going to happen? Oh, it'll go towards the left because it needs to go from high to low. If you remove H2, what's going to happen? Since the low is now H2 and you remove it, more H2 is going to be produced in its place from the reverse reaction. So the equilibrium shifts towards the reactant in this case. Um, okay, so then I could ask a tricky question. What happens to the equilibrium constant when you put a catalyst or when you increase the temperature? The answer is nothing because that's not changing the equilibrium. That is just changing the speed at which the reaction reaches equilibrium. So that's an important concept too. I'm going to write that down in the middle somewhere. So temperature, um, what was the other one? Uh, temperature, catalysts, and what was the third one? I'm blanking here. Um, Oh, yeah, reaction concentration. Duh. All right, so temperature, catalyst, and concentration do not change equilibrium constants. They only change the – I should put reaction concentration. They only change the speed at which the at which equal equilibrium is reached. Okay, that's important. All right, so then you can remove H, you can add H I, and then it goes basically goes towards the place of least stress, and that's the common thing. So um, there's a summary of the different effects by this is a, a good thing to understand. Definitely go over this chart and understand it based on what I was just explaining. Okay, so effect of a catalyst in equilibrium. Oh, we were just talking about this. Adding a catalyst, a catalyst, catalyst speeds up the reaction by lower the activation energy, thus increasing the rate of both the forward and reverse reactions. The time it takes to reach equilibrium is shorter. However, the same ratios of reaction reactants and products are present, meaning the equilibrium constant does not change. It just gets there faster. And, yeah, that's basically what this says. Okay, so now volume. All right. So, and this only applies to gases. So, because gases behave a little bit more different. So, if you, and I'm not, gonna, I'm not sure if there's any questions on this one in the, in the exam. If there is, it's maybe one. Because I don't really focus on gases too much with this principle. But, if you decrease the volume of a gas, it goes towards the direction of the, the least gas moles. That's weird. So if you decrease the volume of the reaction mixture, what that does is it increases the concentration. So if we say concentration, concentration or molarity, remember big M equals moles per liter, right? So if we say that this these two reactants are in a specific moles per liter, if we lower that volume and keep the same amount, we increase their concentration. If that's the case, that's basically the same as adding more. If you decrease the volume, you're going to go more towards the forward reaction because these gases, CO and O2, are going to have more of an opportunity to collide with one another, and they'll shift in the direction. It's not going to shift, sorry. It's not going to shift to the product side. It's going to shift to the direction of the smaller number of moles to compensate. So for gas reactions, it doesn't really depend on concentration. It depends on the number of moles, reactants versus product. So in the reactants here, there is one, two, three, three moles. In the products, there is two. And this is, of course, of the balanced reaction. 
So I hope that makes sense. Then you could do the opposite. If you increase the volume, it'll go towards the most gas moles. So it will, it, it will decrease the concentration of all the gases. And then that means, oh, this decreased concentration of CO and O2. So our product is going to compensate for that by replenishing that concentration. So this is a re pictorial representation. You see the volume gets decreased, more room for collision, more towards the product. Volume is increased. You have products here more towards the reactant in this case, where the wherever the most, wherever the least gas moles is for that case. Okay. Right, right. Oh, sorry for the for largest gas moles. Okay, so uh, a common place where you see this in health is hemoglobin and oxygen. Right. So the way it works is we have hemoglobin in our blood. Hemoglobin binds four oxygen molecules. And each it's like a, a hemoglobin is like a it's a protein, and it's in our white blood cell. It's in our red blood cells, and it uh, binds oxygen. So when there's a high amount of oxygen, high concentration of oxygen, and here's the reaction. Um, it actually, two hemoglobins bind up like there's there's four hemoglobins, and each one of them binds an oxygen. But we could just say it's one to one. When there is a high concentration of O2 in the alveolar of the lungs, which is like the lung sacs. The reaction shifts in the direction of, of oxyhemoglobin, which is HbO2. So high concentration. Oh, we have to relieve this concentration. Goes towards HbO2. Or goes towards the, the forward reaction towards the products. If we had HbO2, which is next, I believe, yeah. So at, if you change the temperature, uh, the, uh, the pressure, there is... This is a more this is more pressure gradient, but okay. So let's let's do um, pressure. Um, so at normal atmospheric pressure, oxygen diffuses into the blood because it's being pushed. So the partial pressure of the oxygen in the alveolar is higher than it of the blood. And think about it: oxygen is being pushed into the av the alveol into the blood when you exhale. Even though obviously we know that CO two is being pushed out. But at the same time, oxygen is being put away. And the reason why that happens is when you exhale, your lung alveolar sacs decrease in volume. When they decrease in volume, that increases their pressure. Remember Boyle's Law. That increases their pressure. And the oxygen goes through the membrane and goes into the blood and goes into hemoglobin. But when you're at altitudes, of, so I hope that makes sense. When you're above alt high altitude, the atmospheric pressure is decreased because remember I talked about um, when we talked about pressure, it's kind of like the force being put on top of you. If you're at 8,000 feet up, you have a lot less air and gravity working close to you. So air, there's less air above you and the gravity, the gravitational force is further away from you. It's 8,000 feet below you is, is the Earth's surface. So putting those two together, you have a, a lower atmospheric pressure. And what that does, it, re it results in a lower pressure of oxygen in the alveolar sacs, which allows you to, your blood to take in less hemoglobin, to take in less oxygen. Now, the reason why athletes train at high altitude is because of that. If they're, they can get their hemoglobin to adjust and, and uh, overexpress. So what your body does is when there's low oxygen or when there's a lower pressure of oxygen in the alveolar sacs, your body expresses more hemoglobin proteins in order to take up all of the oxygen that it can. So if you're at high altitude and you start training, you're running, you need a lot of oxygen. So your body will create more hemoglobin to compensate and to get every single oxygen molecule it can from the lungs. Once you come back down to reality, let's say a, a, a track at, at ground level, you have up to twice as much hemoglobin as somebody else. That means your oxygen will get to your, your bones and your muscles so much faster because you have more oxygen being taken in by your hemoglobin and it'll be utilized quicker. So you can actually, so like if you know if you're sprinting, you're breathing, but it's not really doing anything. It's just everything burns. That's because you are building lactic acid due to the lack of oxygen. They won't develop lactic acid till fat till very later. People who try to uh, train at high altitudes because of, because of this, of, of the all the developed hemoglobin. All right, so 
We talked about exo. This really isn't important. We talked about exothermic and endothermic. Um, this is just a summary of everything. Yeah, don't go over the temperature part. That's like it's just definitions. I, I'm not. I'm not gonna focus on that. Okay, so we'll do this. Oh shit! I started again. Okay, anyway. So indicate the shift in equilibrium of each change. So adding more NO. So if we add more of the product, and this is gases. So if we add more of this gas, it will. Well, since we're adding more product, doesn't matter. Uh, it'll go towards the left, towards the reactants. If we decrease the temperature, it'll go towards, oh, here's heat. So if we decrease, so this is a tricky one. This reaction has heat in it. I'm not going to do this to you. But this reaction has heat in it. If you decrease the temperature, that means you're decreasing the heat input, meaning you're decreasing the reactants because one of the reactants is heat in order for this reaction to happen. So you're going to have a less amount of NO2, therefore, or NO2 reacting. Therefore, to replenish that NO2, the reaction, the react, uh, the reverse reaction is going to happen. If you remove O2, it will compensate and go forward. If you increase the volume, it will go towards the most gas moles. Increasing the volume, most gas moles. So that means two gas moles here, two plus one here. So nothing here means one. So from there's two here, three here. So it'll go towards the right. Removing some NO, it'll make it go towards the right again. Okay, that's it. Um, so there's uh, videos on reaction rate, reaction rate constants, and La Chetelier's principle. Uh, so for my Tuesday class, we had a homework, our chapter eight homework due on the 22nd, which most of you handed in. For my Friday class, the Chapter 8 homework will be due on Friday, the 24th, for, um, or sorry, not the 22nd, for the Tuesday. Tuesday was the 21st. Um, it's after midnight on the 23rd now. So, uh, and then next week will be due the uh, Chapter 9 homework. There's no Chapter 10 homework. And the Chapter 10 homework is, after Chapter 10, it's just going to be the practice exam. And then the exam will be the week after next. All right, so uh, have a good day. Good job to everybody in healthcare. You're doing a great job. Uh, all essential workers, you're doing awesome. And let's stay safe and let's get through this together. All right, until next time.